This is Optimal Relationships Daily, episode 1016, Five Essentials of Healing After an Affair, by Dr. Margaret Rutherford of drmargaretrutherford.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to ORD, the podcast on which I, your host, Greg Audino, read to you from some of the best relationship blogs and books out there, and on Saturdays, take questions from you listeners on how to heal your own relationships. Now today, our featured author, Dr. Margaret Rutherford, has an excerpt for us that's really critical to share here on the show. Today, we'll be learning about how to heal from affairs. I'm so excited about this episode today because affairs are a very troubling but very real part of relationships. And while it can be hard to address them, we really wouldn't be doing our job to help you better your own relationships in full if we left them unaddressed. So, Let's learn some more from Dr. Margaret as we optimize your life. Five Essentials of Healing After an Affair by Dr. Margaret Rutherford of drmargaretrutherford.com I got a call from a TV reporter after the infamous blue dress incident during Clinton's presidency. He wanted to do an interview about the likelihood that the Clintons would break up. I started smiling. I said, If most couples didn't make it through affairs, the divorce rate would be even higher than it is now. You just hear about the ones that don't. Working through an affair is tough. It takes tremendous energy and vulnerability on both sides. The reported numbers are growing, with the percentage of women cheaters rising dramatically, still less than men. Here are my caveats of treatment. Number one, see your therapist together. Trust is an obvious issue. Even if it's talking about his or her feelings of letting go of the love they had for the other person, it's important that the spouse regain their role as confidant, as someone who can be opened up to safely, by saying, I trust you can hear what I am saying and still be committed to working this through. It's vital that those be shared conversations between husband and wife. It's time for openness. Trust has to be regained. This assumes that reconciliation is the goal. If you are not sure, then seeing a therapist individually can be helpful and perhaps necessary. Number two, know that the truth rarely comes out all at once. This is a tough one. The cheating spouse usually, whether they have been caught or whether they have actually come forward, rarely tell the whole story initially. Usually they either feel guilty and extremely protective of their spouse or the person with whom they had the affair, or both. The latter reason can infuriate the spouse. This has to be recognized as a process. It's part of it. Number three, the problems in the relationship did not cause the affair, but they are important to talk about. The spouse who had the affair is totally responsible for going outside the marriage to get his or her needs met. That is clear. The couple wants to create a fresh, enlivened relationship where both can recommit. Leave behind the relationship that was not working. Learn new skills and new ways of communicating so both can feel better about their marriage. Sometimes the cheating spouse is adamant about blaming the marriage, and only the marriage. That's not a good sign. This should be a red flag for anyone trying to make a decision about the future. Number four, the regaining of trust goes both ways. The cheating spouse's job is evident. Ties with the person on the other end of the affair should be cut, however reasonably possible. He or she needs to provide whatever information the other asks for to help them heal. Some people seem to want a lot of information, some very little. If they do not willingly and proactively offer openness to what used to be more private choices, cell phone or bank account passwords, for example, that may be a signal that the hurtful impact of the affair is still not understood or responsibility accepted. Here's a technique for talking. I suggest picking a certain time, two times a week, maybe three. During those times and those times only, the offender should open up, answer any and all questions. The other spouse expresses whatever they need to express. But at the end of that time, and don't make that time too long, an hour of talking about something this exhausting can be enough. And until the next... The affair is not mentioned. This helps keep things from exploding or from the affair gaining any more power than it already has, 
while honoring the need for healing. The affair will be on everyone's mind, but it's got to be fenced in to some degree. You are looking for new information to use for recommitment. There should come a time when the non-cheater finally says to themselves, you know, I just don't need to ask that question. I'm okay with not knowing. That is their goal. Further, the non-cheater's job is to give reassurance to their spouse that trust is building so that hope can be established. The spouse who did not have the affair can sometimes get lost in the details, wanting to know everything. Others don't want to know anything. You have to be careful here. There is potential chaos in either choice. Too many details can lead to obsession. Too little knowledge can lead to later regret. The last thing that someone wants to realize is that 10 or 15 years down the road, their spouse says, you know, I never really forgave you for that affair. I want a divorce. Or never say those words, just act on it. That is very sad. The unforgiving spouse is bitter. The unforgiven, lonely. Number five, it takes time. The process of healing from an affair takes time. Like all grief, it comes in waves. Sometimes it can't go slow enough for one, nor fast enough for the other. There are many variations. Such are the complications of being human. The good news? It can be accomplished, and the commitment can be richer than ever. Not because of the affair, because of the work done to make the relationship a better relationship. You just listened to the post titled, Five Essentials of Healing After an Affair, by Dr. Margaret Rutherford of drmargaretrutherford.com. And everybody, we come to the old community to work on ourselves, right? We all want to do this, especially long term. But therapy can be expensive. Well, there's a new way to grow that we are really excited to be partnering with, and that's TATLAB. TATLAB, or the Angry Therapist Lab, has live Zoom group classes led by a team of therapists and coaches on everything from relationship building tools to conquering codependency, trauma work to breath work, even astrology readings. There's also a social hour in which everyone can talk freely and build new friendships. See, this is not therapy. It's part lecture and part group engagement, a fun way to work on your emotional well-being from home and meet like-minded people while doing so. So go to tatlab.app and use discount code ORD at checkout to get unlimited live classes, plus hundreds of hours of audio lessons and courses on a variety of wellness topics for only 20 bucks, the price of a gym class drop-in fee. For a limited time only, go to www.tatlab.app and the discount code is ORD, all letters in lowercase. This is the new way to grow. We'll see you in the lab. Really thankful for this article today from Dr. Margaret, addressing a really important topic. The recovery process she speaks of, it reminds us of a very important yet underrated part of what makes relationships work, and that's to be on the same page or have the same enthusiasm. For example, if one member of the relationship has an affair, the chances of the relationship being saved are much higher if both partners are committed or enthusiastic about going to therapy together and trying to make it work. Even if one partner has broken the trust, if they are both on the same page about what they want to do from there, it's a good sign. A much more difficult scenario for the relationship to thrive in would be if only one partner is enthusiastic about therapy and the other is not. Even if it feels as though love has been lost between two partners, it's a better scenario if these partners both want to try rather than a scenario in which one partner wants to work on the relationship and the other doesn't, even if they do feel as though they're not necessarily out of love. So, for couples who have maybe fallen on hard times, find something to commit to together. Find some common ground that means a lot to the relationship, and see where emphasizing that bond takes you. All right, friends, that's all for this one. Thanks a lot for being here and sticking with me until the end. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And I'll see you back here tomorrow for a post from Mark Manson. That's where your optimal life awaits.